It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pierce coming to you from Baltimore. The poisoning of Flint, Michigan's water supply exposed the city's children to lifelong negative effects. But now a new study finds that lead in Flint's water has also resulted in less children being born, a 12 percent decrease. The study also found a 58 percent increase in fetal deaths. The authors say Flint has seen a horrifyingly large increase in fetal deaths and miscarriages since its water was poisoned back in April of 2014. That's when Flint changed its drinking water supply from Lake Huron to corrosive Flint River in a bid to cut costs. I'm now joined by the one of the authors of the study, Dr. David Slusky. He's an assistant professor in applied microeconomics at the University of Kansas. Dr. Slusky, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. David, let's begin with how you determine the direct cause and effect here um, that the lead caused the reduction in fertility rates and increased the fetal death rate. So a couple things. One of them is this decision to change the water supply was made by an unelected state-appointed city manager. So you worry in these kind of situations that the particular population, um, not in this case, but in other cases, may have uh, had some role in that decision, and here they didn't. Um, the second thing is that no one really knew there was lead in the water until a year or a year and a half later when the first reports started coming out. Um, we've even looked at this in Google Analytics data and don't see any increases in Googling for the word lead in Flint. Um, the last thing we do is we're going to compare changes in these outcomes in Flint before and after to changes in a variety of comparison studies across the state to control for other things that were changing at the same time. Right. Now, is a high level of lead consistent with both lower birth rates and much higher fetal death rates? And how did you exactly come to that conclusion? So the lower fertility rate um, can happen from a variety of things. It can happen from less conception, miscarriages early in the pregnancy, or fetal death late in the pregnancy. Um, we weren't able to look at conceptions and miscarriages directly because they're not tracked in the vital statistics the way that fetal death is. Um, but there's medical literature about pharmacists prescribing lead pills in the early 20th century to women who wanted to have abortions. Um, and there's other, been other work done in other cities finding similar incre- uh, decreases in the fertility rate and increases in the fetal death rate um, when cities switch to a water source that brings in more lead. Now, okay, let's talk about the ways in which you first identified the problem. I mean, I imagine it's from uh, other research you've done in this area uh, that probably gave you the uh, indication here as the reports were coming out about Flint that this might be the case here. Give us a sense of how you identified that this would be a problem and how you went about actually doing the study. So I've done two other studies that are related in in some way to this. One, um, there's medical literature that vitamin D in the second trimester of pregnancy, the mother's vitamin D, affects asthma and lung development. And so I have another study that used sunlight variation um, to look at how that affected the asthma rates and asthma emergencies for those children once they were born and found a substantial relationship there. Um, I also have some work looking at birth rates in Texas after women's health clinic closures there clinics closed there, um, and there was less access to abortion and less access to contraception and family planning. So I was both familiar with the fetal origins and and fetal exposure side of things, and also with working with birth certificate data on birth rates. And so when this story made national news in January of 2016, I and my co-author thought that we might have a way to look at a causal relationship here on both birth rates and on birth outcomes. Right. Now, uh, give us a sense of um, what other results you have found that concerns you in this study. So we looked at birth outcomes as well, um, about birth weight and other kinds of birth conditions, and we didn't find large effects there. But part of that is that there are two countervailing forces here, um, that if this, this shock during pregnancy is causing the least healthy fetuses to not survive, that would actually raise average outcomes of the survivors. If the survivors are then also being scarred, that would lower their outcomes, and the two effects might cancel out and have us not see anything. One more thing we looked at is we looked at the sex ratio of the live births, and found that that's shifted toward there being more female births 
Um, this has been well documented in health economic literature in a variety of contexts that when there's more stress in a fetal environment, um, the more fragile male fetuses don't survive and the sex ratio shifts toward girls. Right. All right. So how is the city responding to this now? Uh, we have not heard from the city specifically, though our legal process um, in this country has been working its way through indictments and trials of the various involved public officials. Um, and I expect that process to continue now for a long time. Right. There was also an effort at Michigan State, I believe, to set up a registry um, of individuals who may have been affected by this so that they can receive additional screening and treatment going forward. Now, the people of Flint were exposed to more than just direct drinking water. As you just mentioned, uh, it's sure. also bathing water, but uh, people also wash their hands uh, in, in this water. Plants are watered uh, uh, using these waters. Are there other ways in which uh, the water is getting um, routed, I guess, to your body in order to affect birth rates this way? There can be, yes. I mean, I think that talking to some civil engineers and water scientists, it sounds like that the city officials um, who work on water treatment in Flint really had kind of an impossible problem dealt to them with a variety of different issues coming out of the water from the Flint River and often contradictory solutions for dealing with each of those problems. And just a few uh, minutes ago uh, when we sure. were talking, we were rolling in some B-rolls with uh, signs against water fountains in schools, for example, that sure. says, you know, contaminated, do not to drink. Um, do we have a sense of the, you know, post-birth effects on children who might have been exposed to this now, now that the, I know it's not the direct uh, subject of your study, but do we have a sense of how the children are, are faring after being exposed to this contamination? So I haven't seen any studies on that yet in Flint, though those children are really not old enough to be in schools and taking standardized tests. There is research coming out of Providence um, that were able to match up lead readings in individual homes and those children's test scores. And there, there was a very clear negative relationship between lead exposure um, and test scores in schools. We also have other literature um, looking at the phase out of leaded gasoline um, and the impact of that on crime and there's evidence both in the U.S. and from other countries that one of the main reasons we've seen such a large decrease in crime in the last generation was because of the removal from lead and gasoline a generation earlier um, when those young adults were children. Uh, David, coming out of your study, you must have certain recommendations for the city of Flint and, of course, the health departments and hospitals. So, uh, what are they? Well, one of them is that, you know, our study added an estimate of, the, of another dimension of the cost of this water switch beyond other research and other estimates that have been made in Flint and elsewhere. Um, and so, you know, our recommendation often as economists is that those costs and those consequences be taken into account in future policymaking decisions. All right, David, I thank you so much for joining us today. I have a feeling that this is just uh, the first of many interviews on this subject because not only in Flint, but there are uh, sites throughout the world where um, you know people's lives are contaminated in this way and there's these kinds of uh, results appearing uh, in other parts of the world. So I thank you so much for the study as well as for joining us today. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.